Hello class. It is our week three of group. So we're going to be talking about some key terms. Delegation, designated leader, influence, leadership, Machiavellianism, participating, power, selling, task rules, and telling. So remember, the goal of group is always to go from being led by the, the social worker, by the counselor, and then to go to the group facilitating each other. So in the beginning of group, remember, people are not going to say a lot. They're not going to say anything. It's not the beginning of class, I always say. You come in class that first week, um, and people just aren't going to say anything. They're kind of polite and hi and all that good stuff. Um, and then, of course, as the weeks go along, then we get to know each other. Uh, the fourth or fifth week, you're ready to say, hey, you know what? You're always late, Sally. Or Bob, you know, you should bring coffee for everybody, but you wouldn't dare do that in the first group. So let's talk about some of these key terms that we need to know. Okay, here we go, chapter three. Okay, so we're just approaches to leadership. So the one thing about counseling, um, especially in a group setting, is what you bring to the table is you. So I can teach you the skills that I use. I can teach you exactly the steps to group, but what I can't be is you. And that's what makes you so unique. So uh, I know you find it hard to believe, but I'm a really outgoing person. I love group. I love meeting people and talking to people. Um, but if that's not your personality, that's really okay. So the goal is to bring the you-ness, the genuineness, the warmth, all of those things Carl Rogers talked about into the group setting. So the trait approach, Aristotle said from the hour of their birth, some are marked for subjugation, others for command. The trade approach to leadership, which has existed for centuries, assumes that leaders have inherent personality characteristics or trait that distinguishes from others. Eh, right? That maybe you're a, a, a born leader. Uh, I'm a firstborn, right? So, so according to uh, Adler's theory of firstborns, then I should be a natural born leader. Uh, but that's not always the case. Some research on personality traits indicate that leaders tend to be better adjusted and more dominant, extroverted, masculine, I don't know about that, and interpersonally sensitive than their followers. Other traits such as intelligence, enthusiasm, dominance, self-confidence, and egalitarianism hmm, have also been focused to characterize the leaders. Okay. Potential leaders do have more positive attitudes than other group members. They cannot be successful so that the members perceive them as different. For example, Dave and Harris found that B students were the campus leaders, whereas the more intelligent A students were considered the grinds, who occasionally were treated as outcasts for being curve wreckers. You know, when you get the A and set the curb and you break it down, that one kid that got the A. Also, members who talk most have been found to win most decisions. And so leaders, unless he or she talks too much and antagonizes the other person, they're really going to be some of those leaders. So two postulated leadership traits that we're going to look at are charisma and Machiavellianism. So charisma has been defi defined as an extraordinary power of working at miracles. So people who have charisma are people that you really like. There's something about them that you're really just drawn to. 
Um, sometimes we use the term the halo effect. Um, those are people who are, um, you're drawn to them, whether it's their looks or their personality. Uh, they can convince you to do anything. Those are the uh, girls, and well, used to be probably, in the mall that are spraying the perfume, right? And then she sprays it on the guy, and he thinks, wow, she's attractive. Maybe I'll buy this for my wife. It's not always a conscious choice, but there's something about that person that you're drawn to. A lot of our politicians have charisma. So uh, Ronald Reagan was known for that. He was a former actor, um, and the, he wasn't known to be one of the smartest presidents that we had, but he was very charismatic. Um, and thought is because he'd been an actor, he was able to draw people. He was able to put on that show, and people just automatically liked him. So that's charisma. The charismatic leader must have a sense of mission, a belief in the social change movement he or she leads, and confidence in the chosen instrument to lead the movement. Okay? So charismatic leaders, some of them have been, so the following leaders have been referred to as charismatic. So J.F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Caesar, General George Patton, Confucius, Gandhi, and Winston Churchill. All pretty famous names, uh, and they have been said to led by their charisma, not necessarily by power. Now, Machiavellianism, the term Machiavellianism has been associated with the notion that politics is immoral, and that means any means should be used to achieve power. Machiavellian leadership is based on the concept that people are basically fallible, gullible, that means they'll fall for anything, untrustworthy, and weak. Two are impersonal objects, and the manipulation can, and can manipulate as the leader can choose their goal. Okay, so if we look at those four characteristics of Machiavellian leaders, they have little emotional involvement in interpersonal relationships. They're not concerned about conventional morality. They take a utilitarian view. That means I'm going to use you, get whatever I can get out of you. They have fairly accurate perception of the needs of their followers, and they have a low degree of ideology commitment. So they're not really committed to the ideology of the group. They're committed to what's best for them. So we have charismatic leaders, that are warm and kind and really are trying to do what's best. And then I have my Machiavellianism leaders who rule by power. Okay. So in the group, I'm gonna go back to Machiavellianism just for a minute. So if we think about um, some of the leaders that have gotten into power and we look at groups, I always use like the Jim Jones relationship. Um, if you're not familiar with Jim Jones, look it up. That happened way back in the 70s, I think. Let me see there. Most people, most of my students are familiar with uh, drinking the Kool-Aid or don't drink the Kool-Aid, but don't know where it comes from. go to Wikipedia because that's always the best source, right? <laughs> Not for papers, but for information it is. So uh, James Warren Jones, this, he died in 78, he was an American cult leader, uh, preacher and faith healer of the People's Temple. So what happened is that he originally formed this organization in 1990, 1955. Um, it was in Indianapolis. He moved it to California. And really what he did was he got lots of young people, young lost people, um, and brought them into his kind of cult life. Okay? So he, um, he took everybody in, racial integration. It was kind of the, oh, let's just love each other and love God and support God and support each other. Um, any worldly belongings... You sold and gave the money to the temple because you didn't need any or any of those belongings. Um, we had a couple of really 
uh, famous people, their kids, um, that really, uh, they were upset because their son, their sons and their daughters were giving this, this money, other things, selling their car, selling their houses and giving the money to Jim Jones. So Jim and his wife traveled, uh, adopted several non-white children, um, according to the household of the, the Rainbow family. He also thought the temple would be the Rainbow family. So back in the time, remember this is like, you know, the, the 60s and the 70s, integration was really just struggling. So in, in what happened when he was in California, a lot of the parents began to protest. Um, they would call the police and demand that the police go in and get their children. Um, and his Machiavellianism, man, his, chari his charisma, had really wooed the people. So they weren't interested in leaving. They were okay with giving their money to him. So um, when he decided that uh, the, the, when they moved to California, the, the, that's when the problems really started happening. So then he decided that to escape America and escape all of the stuff, the rules, the people, the taxes, he decided that he would move his temple to Jonestown. So he took all of these people and they um, moved out of the country. And again, parents were still very, very upset. So the uh, U.S. Um, military decided to go in and to really kind of save some people. Um, the congressman, when they got off the plane, they really had no idea what they were going into, so they got off the plane and they, uh, the, the, um, the Jim Jones fans, the people of the temple, um, began shooting. They began shooting the people. Um, so the first time they got off and they started shooting, they left. They came back later. Um, and then um, their goal was, so Jim Jones had preached that the world was going to come to an end. He had preached that those outsiders, those uh, white men, the military were going to come and, and take us all. So what he did is he had a plan that there was, uh, and they had practiced this before according to the news, that if they saw the world coming to an end, they would go ahead and do, they would kill themselves. So when the army came back and they came back to really get the people out, the kids out, um, Jim Jones had instructed all of his followers to commit suicide. So if you hear the term, the drink the Kool-Aid or the great Kool-Aid, that's where it comes from. It happened in 1978, probably before most of you were born. It was a cyanide-laced grape Kool-Aid. So that's a little bit about him when we talk about leaders. Um, so he used all of his, his charisma and his Machiavellianism, right, the leadership, to get what he thought needed to be done. Okay. So inside of a group session, there are always going to be people who take on leadership roles. Now, this is not something that I'm, I'm asking you to do this or can you do this. Leadership roles really are people's personality, and the roles can change. So I can be a, 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 the maintenance person today, and next week maybe I'm going to be take on a different role. So through consider through considerable research on problem solving groups, Bates identified two specific functions: the task specialist and the social emotional or group maintenance specialist. Okay. So task roles refer to the task, getting things done. So under the task roles, here are a couple of things that you might see. Okay. <clears throat> Initiating, proposing a task of goals, defining a group problem, information, the information of opinion seekers, requesting facts, seeking selective information from people in the group. Clarifying, clarifying, remember, is one of those active listening skills. So clarifying, I'm gonna use what I don't understand. So you said this, this is, is what you mean. So I always wanna clarify, especially if it's a term that I'm not familiar with. Uh, I might have a 17 year old and she speaks a different language than I do. And sometimes she'll say something like, what does that mean? Okay, so clarify, clarify. Interpreting or reflecting ideas and suggestions, clarifying conclusions, and then summarizing. Summarizing is the end. So at the end of the group or the end or beginning of the group, I'm going to summarize what we did today. Okay, so summarization is wow, we worked on this and this today. And this is talking about task groups. Remember, 
Task groups are groups that have to get something done. That means you're ordered for um, uh, stress management, anger management, something like that. You've been ordered to get something done, or you have to get something done. There's a task that needs to be done. You can summarize at the end of the group, or you can summarize at the beginning of the group. So summarize at the end of the group, you talk about where we're at and how everybody's doing. At the beginning of the group, we're summarizing our last session. So last week we did this, this, and this, and this, and this week we're going to continue. Consensus testing, okay? So checking with the group to see how they reach an agreement. So in group settings, we don't want majority rule. We want consensus. Consensus means can we all live with it? Okay, not majority rule. That is going to break the group off in factions, and we don't want that. We want the group to be a whole. That one whole group, of course, is my, my client. Maintenance roles, those are the ones that preserve or strengthen the emotional bond in group. So you'll see encouraging. Yay, 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 right? Oh my gosh, Barbara, you spoke last time. You can speak again today. Harmonizing, that's reducing tension. So, uh, you know, um, somebody says something in group and the other person says something uh, back to them that's not appropriate. The harmonizer will say, hey, you know, I really don't think Jim meant to hurt your feelings, right? So we're trying to harmonize and keep peace in the group. Expressing group feelings, fostering communication. You might see the term linking. Fostering communication is, is getting people to talk to each other. Linking is the term where I have a, a, a woman who's gone through divorce and the new person comes in who's, who's upset because they're going through divorce and I'll say, hey, you know, Jim, can you tell Mary how you survived? Or tell, give Mary some clues of how to get through this. Part of group is universalization. I realize I'm not the only one going through whatever I'm going through. Okay. A task leader emerges in many groups because he or she has the best idea and does most group discussions. Think about, um, sometimes I'm trying to think outside of school. Maybe at work, uh, maybe in other areas, you've been put on a group and things need to happen. So many times I'll appoint a leader to the group, Bob, you're the leader, but the task person is really good about uh, organizing the task. Okay, so that might be the task leader, but you may not be the official leader of the group. Um, some of the theories talk about, uh, well, Blanchard referred to a situation as telling. The leadership behavior is most effective when the leader determines the roles of the members and tells them, tells them how and why and what to do the task. The task maturity of members increases and their experience and the understanding of the task increase. The combination of behaviors as, is, is, is called as a sell it. The leader should not only provoke a clear direction within the role and take responsibility, but also use those maintenance behaviors, right, to get people to buy in. We don't like being told what to do. We like having suggestions and then all of us buying into that and then we're working on the task at hand. Other roles that you might see, okay, the executor, they coordinate the activities of the group, the policy maker, the planner, the expert, that's the person who has information, uh, external group representation, maybe he speaks outside of the group, the purveyor of rewards and punishment, arbitrator and mediator, um, ex expl explamar, that's one who sets the example. So again, all of these are kind of groups, group roles that you might take on in a task section, members would take on in a task-based group. So I talked about power when I talked about charisma and Machiavellianism, right? Well, there's some power, and leaders in the group need to have power. Although the use of power in human interaction is often viewed negatively, in fact, a normal part of relationships uh, are frequently being in normal relationships. We're often um, we're often influenced by others. Okay. So even the husband and wife information, a, a friendship. So sometimes we, we're wearing what we're wearing or doing what we're doing because we got influence from someone else in our life. So what we need to remember is the term power and influence, and this time we're gonna use them um, for the same thing, 
Um, we have to be careful that we don't want to overuse that power and we don't want to over influence anybody. So remember the group, the goal of group, even a task group, is self-determination. Clients have the right to make their own decisions and we don't want to enforce our decisions onto a client. Each group, each group member has a need to control what's happening in group because people join group to attain personal goals. They can't achieve them individually. If members do not exert power, their chance of achieving their own goals are small. Okay, so if I've got my own goal in group and someone is trying to influence me to uh, think the way they do or to act the way they do, that's really taking away some of the power um, of each individual group member. Group members in conflict sometimes resort to manipulation. That is, they influence each other for their own purpose or profit. Sounds like those game shows. You know, like um, the circle, you ever see that, those dating game shows? Um, or I'm trying to think of some of the others. I don't want a lot, watch a lot of TV. Um, I guess even like when you live in the house, those kind of shows, um, that you see the members, and that's a group right there in this setting for this period of time, um, you see them manipulating each other to get what they want. Okay? In a healthy group, that's not what we want to happen. Manipulation is a destructive kind of power. Influence with integrity is what we want to do. Okay, We want to lead the group, we want to influence the group, but we want to do it in, 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 with integrity and following the code of ethics where clients or people have the right to their own self-determination. Okay. You would see these terms other places. You might see them in actual um, leadership in an office, but these terms, and especially, uh, will be on the test. So when you're taking your licensure test, know these terms. Reward power. Reward power is the power I get because I, uh, I, I've done the right thing. Reward power includes things such as promotions, pay increases, days off. Reward power is based on uh, B's, the one member's perception of the other group member. Okay, so well, wow, you did great today. Reward power can backfire, though, if group members felt they're being connived or bribed. Okay, so we don't want to connive them or bribe them, but we also want to reward clients or our, our, our group members. That's one kind of power. Coercive power is not the best kind. I'm coercing you to do what I want you to do. The ability to fire someone, the ability to, uh, the power to uh, kick them out of group, the power to kick them out of class, uh, the power when you're on the circle and the, you get to boot somebody out. That's coercive power. It's thereby threatening. Right? So that's why group members try to develop alliances because they don't want to be kicked out. Legitimate power is based on the internalized value or norm and probably the most complex of the five power bases. Legitimate power is based on the perception that the group members have legitimate right to prescribe the constitutional proper behavior. So the, legit, the legitimate power is usually the one who is on top. That is, the, the name is on there. I'm the legitimate power. Okay, I'm the president. I am the one running the group. I am the one responsible. That's legitimate power. However, um, it really may not, just because you're legitimate on, the, on paper, doesn't mean that you're recognized as the legitimate power in the group setting. A supervisor for a factory has the right to assign the assignments. The third basis for legitimate power is to legitimize uh, is a legitimizing agent, for example, the election process legitimizes a person's right for that position. So legitimately, you won the election. May not be popular, but Biden won the election. Okay, so that legitimate leader, he's the legitimate leader of the country. However, we do know there are other power bases um, that are trying to be legitimate leaders when the legitimate elected leader is, is, is Biden. Referent power, you'll see. Referent power comes because I have a relationship with you. I get to go to lunch with you. Um, uh, our daughters went to the same preschool together. That gives me some, some referent power. Okay? So uh, the referent power is if I act like the leader, I, I hang out with the leader, have lunch with the leader, then therefore I have some side of power. 
Um, and whether it's, I, I use that or not, it is believed by the others that I have some side of power. Because, you know, Pam's always hanging out with the leader. They're having lunch together all the time. Do you notice that? So that's that legitimate, I'm mean, sorry, that's that referent power. Expert power, again, expert power, you're the, you're, you may not be the legitimate power, but you're the expert. Um, I always say kind of in a group setting, um, there are some people who are just really good at something. In an office setting, we look at the hierarchy of needs. The, I'm sorry, we look at the power structure. So there's definitely um, excuse me, the leader. There's someone who's in charge, the legitimate leader that we all have to um, respect um, because he's a legitimate leader. However, if you have someone on your team that has a really good uh, expertise, let's say in a social work agency, that you have someone who is an excellent grant writer. Right? So while the boss is the boss, the grant writer has got this expertise that the boss really needs. Okay? So legitimate power is still here, but I can't get things done without my expert. So that's the expert power. So again, reward power, cohesive power, uh, coercive power, legitimate, referent, and expert power. Those are the terms that you always see on those uh, tasks, guys. Okay, the effects of unequal power. So we all know that we don't want to have unequal power. Um, we don't want to dominate anybody. We don't want to, um, it, it is our job to make sure that we equalize the power. It's not majority rules. We're not trying to do that, we're trying to reach consensus. Um, and yes, there are definitely groups and there are places um, in this group arena that we need to have um, a leader However, we don't have to do that by uh, um, putting down the other group members. So high power members seek um, avoid revealing weaknesses because they fear the lower power people may come and think that they're undeserving of the power. And we think like uh, uh, TV stars, right? We think, oh my gosh, she's so amazing. She's so perfect. And we idolize her because she's so perfect. Um, and then when those very human TV stars do something wrong, um, most often normal, uh, we sometimes then look down on them. We don't see them in the same light that we used to see them. When threatened, high power people may maintain power by instituting rules or norms that legitimize their power. Okay, great example. After the South lost the Civil War, um, the white power structure in the South sought to maintain power by keeping schools, restaurants, and public restrooms segregated. Okay, so they lost the power. The law was saying that, you know, um, that it's, it's equal. Um, however, the South kept the power, even though they lost, uh, by then um, making the, the Jim Crow laws, right? So ridiculous laws that, didn't, that black people could not get ahead. Uh, the Jim Crow laws, and especially uh, when it comes to voting, um, that's something that's probably still a lot sore for people, especially in the South. When uh, blacks were freed and had the right to vote, um, they would come up with these laws that were impossible. Um, you would have to uh, like guess the number of jelly beans in a jar, or tell me how many feet uh, between here and the school. Um, you, you had to have at least 5,000 cattle. Things that just weren't possible and sometimes ridiculous in order to keep black people out of having some of that legitimate power of voting. Blacks in the South were lynched for many offenses, seek to be serving, seek to be, for seeking to be served in white restaurants. In addition, high power members may seek, may seek to deter low power members from rebelling. Okay? And I think in society today, we still see a lot of that uh, when it comes to power and wanting to give up power. Low power people can use a variety of strategics to change the power distribution, like voting, right? One, to endeavor themselves by frequently complimenting the high power status. You're trying to get along with them. Okay. Um, an example, a coalition was formed. It was formed with leaders in the right in the Roman Catholic Church in an attempt to make abortion illegal. Okay. So right to life group who didn't have the power at the time joined the people with the power in attempts to make abortion illegal. So that's, that's an example of 
I don't have the power, and I'm going to co I'm going to join a coalition with those who do have the power, so we can see get things done. Um, the biggest one we'll know, and it's Sal Alinsky. Sal Alinsky was a community expert. So he really looked at in the, the inner cities, the ones who didn't have the power, to really help them gain power um, and really start community social work and change in community. Uh, those social workers always think, oh my gosh, those community questions are so hard. All I really want to do is be a good clinician and talk to the people. Um, but that micro power, the change that happens, the power that to give people power to the people is a huge deal. So Saul Alinsky um, and his associates back in the 60s, they were working with citizens groups known as the Woodland Organization in the inner city of Chicago. So we know now even still inner city of Chicago is very poor. We see a lot of violence there um, based on poverty um, and the inability to, to, to escape that poverty. So it became clear that the uh, it came clear that the commitment would not be on. Uh, the, the city commission said yes, it would make some changes, but they didn't do it. The Woodland Committee sought to pressure the city into meeting its commitments. They proposed solutions to embarrass the city officials. So one of the things they did is they locked up all of the bathrooms at O'Hare, the busiest airport. So Alinsky said, Um, the, also, the intelligence study was launched to see how many sit-down toilets are both men and women, as well as stand-up urinals. The consequence of this kind would be catastrophic in many ways. People would be desperate to find a place to relieve themselves. Children were yelling at their parents, Mom, I've got to go, I've got to go, but there was no place for them to go. Um, this, threat, this, th this threat of tactic was leaked, ha-ha-ha, <laughs> leaked. Um, back to the administration, and within 48 hours, the city honored their commitments. So what he learned is there was definitely power in that. Okay, my advantages of co-leadership. Uh, remember, with co-leadership, all we want to do is make sure that we have the, um, that co-leaders are using the same kind of dynamics, the same kind of approach. How to start and lead a group. Okay. So for most of all, in general, when I'm doing a group session, what I'll do is we'll start off with check-in. Check-in is just, sometimes I'll say, give me your roses and thorns, um, best and worst. Is there something you've been dying on? Or something as simple as, uh, you know, what you have for breakfast today? We do rounding, so everyone gets a chance to check in. And that's what we want, is everyone gets a chance to say, hey, this is what I, this is what we're working on, this is what I need, okay? So, homework, successful group leader is extension, does extension preparation. So, if at all possible, we really also should pre-screen the people that come into the group, but we don't have that option many times, especially if they're court ordered. So, my homework before group is how many members are gonna be in there? What is our lesson? What are we doing? What are we talking about? Okay, uh, the standards, and these are the social work standards. Um, by the social work group, it talks about the purpose, our core values, the core values of knowledge. Okay, core values of knowledge of information. We've got to have it, knowledge. I can't be teaching a group on, um, you know, uh, so, um, uh, intimate, uh, IPR, intimate, uh, intimate person violence or domestic violence, I can't teach that if I haven't studied and learned about that. That's an ethical. So I need to make sure that I have learned my part before I do what I'm, what I'm trying to do. Okay. Strengths-based leadership. Strengths-based leadership, strengths-based therapy, um, any time that we leave from a strengths base means we're really looking at what is best for the client. Okay, so we know that all clients have some strengths. So stress, strength based leadership is really looking at amplifying the strengths of others. 
finding the, the strengths of my group members so we can all be on the same page. Um, so it's easy to find the faults, but if I start finding the strengths in my client, then I'm able to really um, understand what's, what's going on. Um, I'm working with a, for example, you work with a woman um, and she's got four kids and the kids are all, um, they're all struggling academically. Um, she's barely keeping a roof over their head. Um, she's working as many jobs as she can. Um, the, the strength would be, you know, she's keeping a roof over their head. I'm going to really look at, you know, praising her for what she's done instead of all the things that she hasn't done. So in summary, this chapter we talked about the five major approaches to leadership, identifying, elective, uh, identifying effective group leadership, understanding the use of power, right, power and influence, understanding the effects of unequal power in groups, those coercive reward legitimate powers, and learning how to start a group, and really understanding the strengths of leadership of a group. Okay, I'm going to wrap that up. That was my chapter three. Um, group dynamics talking about leadership.